So rather than have a dog and pony show on devices, I thought that uh, I think the most compelling part of uh, this whole discussion should be why. Why are we uh, so concerned about uh, going away from the coil and pave or coil and co cover mentality that has existed over the last several years since we've uh, had EVAR in existence? Um, when we talk about the kind of hostile nature of a AAA when it involves the common iliac artery as well, uh, according to what we've seen uh, out of over 6,000 patients in the Eurostar experience, 28% of these folks with iliac aneurysm, we saw that you saw more hypogastric occlusions, more 1 and 1B one and 2 endo leaks, more requirements or nece necessity for uh, secondary reinterventions, and aneurysm ruptures. So this is a, a nefarious player for sure. Um, and so I think that uh, we were compelled to do something about this and, and trying to do the coil and pave was a, a reasonable option at the time before this technology existed. And uh, according to this prospective database, we saw about 25% of almost 600 EVARs that showed uh, buttock claudication at one month and persisting uh, out to one year and beyond at 34% with sexual dysfunction at 20%. So obviously you're not going to have a happy cohort when, when you have to do this. Um, again, more, more evidence of, of the same problem. 25% of uh, patients in this particular paper had uh, buttock claudication, and it persisted in about half of those folks. Uh, and quality, quality of life clearly is going to be affected uh, significantly. Uh, and then there is that uh, you know, small number, but 2.8% of having a fatal acute pelvic ischemic complication. So it is something to strongly consider uh, when weighing the options on your patients that have iliac aneurysm uh, degeneration. Here's a, another paper here from uh, a meta-analysis of uh, uh, 124 uh, publications. And you can see that the non, uh, not insignificant numbers of buttock muscle necrosis, spinal cord injury, ischemic colitis, and bladder necrosis. And it's no surprise that when you have to attack the bilateral hypogastric circulation, you see a devastating increase. Up to 83% of these folks have complications, especially those people that have PAD. And it's important to know uh, in, in that uh, just kind of passing over of spinal cord ischemia that it's a huge issue. And I don't think we often appreciate enough what role uh, the hypogastric arteries play in that uh, uh, cascade uh, of uh, blood flow to the, to the cord, uh, also the subclavian arteries. So as we get more and more complex, as the previous presenter demonstrated, where we're going higher and higher, and we're getting to the realm of the total endovascular aorta, it's, I think, imperative that, you know, with the failure rates of some of these devices that may lead to higher cuffing in the future or what have you, that you do everything humanly possible to preserve the blood flow to the hypergastric arteries for precisely this complication. Even occlusion of one internal iliac artery is associated with the risk of immediate spinal cord ischemia and a lack of recovery. So if nothing else, you should kind of be compelled out of fear that, you know, maybe this is something that we should just totally abandon, coil and pave, unless there's specific players that are reasonable to uh, consider for that approach, which I'll uh, mention in a moment. But again, this whole idea of total endovascular aorta and covering more and more with these amazing branch graphs and what have you, I think uh, compels us to start thinking that maybe the new standard of care is preservation of the hypogastric at all costs. Um, but what about good old-fashioned surgery? Well, you can have a hybrid approach where you're doing AAA stent grafts and, is, and, and then uh, going in and doing a uh, external to internal iliac artery bypass. It's a straightforward retroperitoneal exposure, 100% technical success rate in this particular paper with no perioperative deaths. Uh, unfortunately, with the, with the uh, occluded side, you still see the same problem. So, you know, you obviously want to try to do bilateral uh, reperfusion if, if possible. Um, what about snorkels, as was mentioned earlier? Well, this is a paper out of UCL, UCLA uh, that uh, showed a four-month follow-up with reasonable results, 88% technical success rate. Uh, but again, this is kind of a, um, kind of a, a rig job, if you will, and, and, and now that we've got uh, more options at our disposal that have FDA approval and IFU uh, recommendations, it's probably safer for us to follow that uh, approach. The oldest device, I think, that uh, was available worldwide was the Cook Zenith branch uh, graft. This is not yet available here uh, in the United States, but uh, is something that uh, will hopefully give us another option. It's certainly seen uh, a lot of utility, um, but unfortunately, as we've mentioned over and over again in this session, 
going off the IFU is going to lead to uh, problems. 62% of patients, when they were looked at uh, from the CAT scan uh, approach, saw that they just weren't uh, eligible candidates for a, a conventional IBD. And the most common feature was an internal iliac artery aneurysm. So I think uh, you saw all kinds of novel techniques, like in this paper, where they went in and they used ICAST and they used uh, Viabonds and self-expanding stents and had great technical success rate um, with no evidence of endoleaks. But again, how much are you willing to push the envelope? That, that, that really depends on your center and your skill set. Uh, overall, looking at multiple centers, though, with these IBDs, tremendous technical success rate. Um, but you still have a significant amount of branch occlusion. And again, talking about spinal cord ischemia and what have you, these are, these are things that uh, we have to be totally aware of. Uh, and the nice thing here is that when you attempt to re reperfuse these areas, you're going to uh, avoid uh, lifestyle limiting problems like uh, buttock claudication. So we've already seen numerous times in several of these uh, presentations that uh, the Gore uh, iliac branch endoprosthesis is uh, available. It has been for about a year. Uh, our center has certainly enjoyed uh, the utility of this device, uh, but one thing that uh, I think a lot of us may not be aware of, for those of you that haven't used this, is that this is absolutely not intended to be used on its own. And we've used it in our center several times on its own, and that's considered totally off-label. So it's important for you to know that this is intended to be used with the excluder AAA device. So you may not be aware of that, but that's what's on the IFU. Uh, according to these 62 patients with six-month follow-up, uh, very uh, good results, 98.4% uh, freedom from reintervention, 0% erectile dysfunction, aneurysm enlargement, et cetera, uh, with a great technical success rate. Uh, but I think the bottom line here is that um, these folks um, that are younger, active, uh, and have complex aneurysmal disease are probably the folks that you should be looking at to uh, revascularize. And the folks that may actually be reasonable candidates for a coil and, and cover or a coil and pave are those of advanced age that clearly have poor mobility, they don't walk, uh, those folks that have an infrarenal AAA, uh, and if they have a good contralateral internal iliac artery, then there may be cross filling into the pelvis and, and you may get away with it. But again, the statistics show that most likely you are going to have some long term detriment to the quality of life. So, again, I would argue that. The iliac preservation is probably the new standard of care. Common iliac artery aneurysms are bad players. Uh, and uh, preserving uh, the iliac with these new devices uh, has shown to be safe and effective, high technical success rate, low mortality, morbidity rates, uh, reintervention re rates are comparable to EVAR, and uh, durable with low branch occlusion rates. Thank you very much. What's your approach when they have bilateral common iliac aneurysms? The iliac, you can't really use that iliac branch device bilaterally. Sure you can. can Absolutely, you? yes. We've done it. It's not hard. You just got to do them one at a time. <laughs> but uh, I think that's the idea, as, as I presented here. If you have to include one side, that's the side that you're probably going to have some physiologic manifestations of claudication and even one side, as I'd mentioned also, is, is uh, a player that could cause uh, spinal cord ischemia. So yes, if, if the, the, the problem is having somebody that will fall within the IFU, and, and that's the challenge, is that yeah. you may not have that. So again, you may be looking at uh, an iliac branch on one side and then maybe doing a small retroperitoneal exposure and doing an external to iliac artery bypass on the other. Yeah, for some reason, in the in when that device was in trial with Gore, they would only allow you within the trial to do one side. Even if both sides fell within the IFU, they required the one of them to be coil embolized. But yeah, there there have been. I know I haven't done one, but I know a lot of people have done have done them bilaterally since the device has been approved. Yeah, it's totally doable. <laughs>